the next two lectures we're going to talk about trying to avoid virus infections, preventing them, and trying to cure them. So today we'll talk about uh, vaccines. And if you've taken the uh, immunology course, how many of you took Moshewitz's? So this is a similar lecture, but a little different so that you don't get bored. And then there's other stuff that we didn't cover in that, in that lecture. So I tell you many times in this course that we are continuously assaulted with viruses. And the reason why we are able to survive all these assaults is because we have a great immune system. I tell you this all the time that uh, it fights off most incursions. And if it's down, if we're immunosuppressed, then we have a problem. And of course, the immune system is the basis of vaccine strategy. And this is a neat graph of life expectancy from 1900s to roughly the present. And you can see it's gone up. There are lots of reasons for this. Uh, science and technology mainly, public health, vaccines, drugs, antibiotics, antivirals, and so forth. So uh, vaccines are a big part of this. They really do prolong your life. Instead of dying at 30 or 40 years of age from an infection, you uh, die much later. So vaccination uses our immune system to uh, protect us against infection, and it uses memory, of course, in order to do that. And the reason it works in a population is because it breaks the chain of transmission. Remember, viruses need to go from host to host. One, infecting one host is of no use. They have to go from host to host. And if they encounter enough immune hosts, transmission will be stopped. So this is a key concept. Uh, modern day immunization really began uh, with Jenner in 1796. You may remember that um, smallpox was a big deal back then, killed a lot of people, has killed hundreds of millions of people uh, since history has been recorded. And Jenner noticed that milkmaids never got smallpox, and milkmaids would get cowpox from cows that they milked. They would get lesions on their hands, but they never got smallpox. So he said, maybe if I immunize a kid with cowpox, it'll protect him. So he took some uh, material from a lesion. Of course, back then we didn't know about viruses, 1796. But he, he understood this idea of protection, which was pretty smart. So he uh, took the material from a cowpox lesion, injected a boy with it. And then a few, then two weeks later, he injected the boy with smallpox, with smallpox pustule. Boy, if he had waited one week, he would have been out of luck, right? Because you need really two weeks to get a good antibody response. I don't, I don't know why he picked two weeks, but that's serendipity. That's the way it goes. So that's the beginning of immunization. And from that point, a smallpox vaccine was developed, which we used and we use until this day, in fact. Pasteur made the rabies vaccine. That was the next one in 1885. And he actually introduced the term vaccination from the Latin vaca, which means cow. And that's because of Jenner's cowpox. So whenever you say vaccine, you're honoring Jenner. And since then, uh, after rabies, the next vaccines made were yellow fever uh, and influenza, and we'll talk about a few others today. Now, the anti-vaccine movement started with the first vaccine of Jenner. This was a uh, etching from the time, the cowpox or the wonderful effects of the new inoculation. I think it says the publication of the Anti-Vaccine Society. This is 1790 or something like that. It's already anti-vaccine movements. They thought you would grow cow parts out of your arm if you got this uh, smallpox vaccine. So there's something about vaccines that people just don't seem to like. We have used vaccines on massive scales now since then, and these campaigns can eliminate diseases. So here, for example, the polio vaccine uh, introduced in 1954 uh, eliminated polio from the US and the introduction of measles could eliminate polio, uh, could eliminate measles, excuse me, but we have many people who don't get um, the measles vaccine. We also have people that don't get the polio vaccine, but as you will see, you don't have to have everyone immunized to stop spread, and that, the number depends on the virus, and apparently for polio, uh, you can have more people unimmunized and still not get spread. And remember, with measles, a long-term sequelae, a persistent version, is SSPE. 
which was here, the rate per 100,000 before the vaccine, you see that goes down as well. So large scale immunization campaigns uh, can be very successful. So today we immunize everything that walks. We immunize children and adults. We, we immunize our domestic pigs and, and chickens and cows. We even immunize wild animals. Now, how do you think you can immunize a wild animal? Do you chase it and try and <laughs> inject it? No, you, you put the vaccine in food and you throw it out of a helicopter and the, and the animals eat it. That's how we immunize wild animals against rabies. We use rabies vaccine laced bait. So many childhood diseases are rare. Uh, I've often told you about me having chicken pox or measles or mumps when I was a kid because we didn't have these vaccines. Now you don't get these because you're immunized. Unfortunately, this is a first world thing mostly. Third world still hasn't come up to the rate of vaccination that we are at for many reasons, for monetary reasons, although we're trying to fix that. There's a lot of philanthropy going on that's trying to fix it, but it makes you healthy. It makes you not worry about being sick and not being able to go to school or whatever. Really preventing diseases is very important for having a creative and productive society. So vaccines work because you maintain a certain level of immunity in the population. You have to look at a vaccine effect in a population level. And so you need a certain number of people to be immune to stop transmission. And the number, again, depends on the virus. And if you drop below this level, then you get transmission. So this is what's happened in Syria recently. There was no polio in Syria until conflict uh, prevented people from delivering vaccines. The immunization rate went from in the 80 percent to 46 percent. And now we have an outbreak of polio because virus is always being introduced. It's not eradicated yet. And if you drop below a certain level, we have an outbreak. There's another concept that's important, and that's herd immunity. Herd immunity. When I lecture medical students and I talk about herd immunity, I hear this soft mooing in the audience. But clear, clearly, you are more mature than medical <laughs> students. So there's a drop in maturity as you go to medical school. So what is herd immunity? It has nothing to do with immunizing animals. It has to do with the fact that you need to have a certain fraction of the population immune, and then you'll protect the non-immune people. That's herd immunity. You're protected from a disease by the immunized people, even if you're not uh, immunized. And obviously measles has a really high threshold because you can have just little pockets of individuals not vaccinated and you get outbreaks. So the, vi the threshold is virus and population specific, not just virus, but the particular population as well. So smallpox, you need 80 to 85 percent of the people immune in order to stop virus spread. So that number means immune people. Measles is higher, 93 to 95, probably because the reproductive index, R0, uh, is high. So one person can infect 15 to 20 people. So that's probably part of it. Now, the problem here, and this, these are different for every vaccine, for every virus, the problem is no vaccine is 100% effective. No vaccine that we make, if you immunize 100 people, you'll never get 100 people making antibodies that neutralize. So you have to take that into consideration. So for measles, for example, if you immunize 80% of the population, only 76% is immune. That's not bad, actually, but you have to take this into calculation when you're figuring out your herd immunity. Now, as you know, and as I've mentioned many times, the public has a problem with vaccines. A lot of people don't want to be immunized. Now, we have a set of childhood vaccines that you must take in order to go to school. However, you can have religious or medical exemptions in some states, not all states, and get out of it. All right? So your polio and measles, mumps, rubella, you can get out of those. You shouldn't, but people do. I don't understand a philosophical objection against being healthy, but that's what they say they have. However, other vaccines are not required, like the influenza vaccine. You don't have to take it. It's, it's up to you. And these are some of the reasons why people don't want to take these voluntary vaccines. I never get the flu. That, my colleagues always tell me that. Um, vaccines make you sick. They cause autism. They don't cause anything, of course. I know a guy who got the flu shot and then got the flu. This is a really common one. I mean, what do you think? If you get a flu shot and then, a, then five days later you get a respiratory infection, what do you think is going on? Well, it could be a different virus entirely, right? Or five days isn't enough to get a good 
um, immune response. You really need two weeks. So there are reasons for this. I don't have time this year. Anyway, these are problems. <laughs> these are pro I got my flu shot this year. You can find it on Facebook, my picture of me getting my flu shot. I, I, um, when, when you have these kinds of attitudes, and people do, absolutely. For some reason, they don't think seriously about it. I mean, flu kills between 5,000 and 40,000 people in the US every year. That's serious stuff, right? But it, people seem to think that this can't happen to them. So you may not have had flu for 20 years, but what if you get it? Uh, and then you're gone. So these, these issues make immunization somewhat of a problem. First question is up, uh, what is herd immunity? Who picked number one, really? <laughs> okay, I'm laughing, it's funny. It's obviously number two. Everyone, not everyone must be immune to protect a population. Not everyone has to be immune. That's herd immunity. Um, everyone must be immune is wrong, number three. Number four is my play, is my playing around, of course. Group think has nothing to do with it. Okay, so not everybody has to be immune. That's the concept with herd immunity. So let's talk about how to make a vaccine, and then we'll talk about some examples of vaccines that work. You have to make the right immune response. And what's the right immune response? Well, think back to our lecture on adaptive responses. We talked about Th1 versus Th2 responses, depending on the dendritic cells, what they're sensing, what kinds of cytokines they make, how they interact with T cells in the lymph node. Our vaccine has to mimic that. It has to make it the same as for the pathogen. You don't want to have the wrong immune response. You, if the virus protection needs CTLs, you don't want to be making antibodies. So you need to know what's important and somehow get your vaccine to do that. And obviously, you have to be protected against disease by the virus. You can't just get an immune response. Some vaccines will make an antibody response or a T cell response, but they're not protective. The, the responses have to protect you. So you, when you're testing a vaccine, you have to make sure you test protection. And this is an interesting idea with this Ebola outbreak that's been ongoing in Africa. People are saying, why don't we make an Ebola vaccine? Well, how would you test it? You know, these outbreaks are quite rare and they don't involve large numbers of people. So it would be very difficult to test for a disease that, excuse me, that's quite rare. Now, most of the vaccines that we'll talk about, all of them, with this exception, are active vaccines. You put a modified form of the virus into the host, and that induces immunity. You put the virus itself, an attenuated virus, a piece of the virus, and you make antibodies, you make memory. That's active vaccines. A passive vaccine is when you inject people with antibodies or T cells. And this gives you quick protection. It doesn't last, doesn't give you any memory, of course. But there's some cases where you need that. And the most common use is rabies. Here's a vial of rabies immune globulin. This is produced from people who are immunized with rabies vaccine. They take their serum and they make sure it doesn't have other viruses in it, of course. And then they purify the uh, serum and, and you, you can give it to people who get bitten by a rabid animal. So if you get a dog bite on your hand, they would inject the rabies immune globulin into the bite to neutralize virus. And in addition, they would immunize you because you do have time to immunize before the virus reaches the CNS. And of course, we are passively immunized when we are born. We have the antibody experience of our mother. And so the maternal IgG, so this is the development of a human from conception, gestation to birth and, and adult years, and this is fraction of adult level. You can see that uh, you get maternal IgG transferred across the placenta, it peaks just before birth. And when you're born, you have this, your mother's experience of antibodies, so you're protected until your immune response can kick in, because we don't make uh, antibodies until a few months after birth. Uh, and so in the meantime, the passive antibodies from your mother protect you. So this is a natural passive vaccine, essentially. It's really amazing that this happens. And of course, if your mother hasn't encountered a lot of the pathogens that you're going to see at birth, then you will be infected by them. So what, what do we need a vaccine to be if it's good? It has to be safe, of course minimal side effects. No vaccine is without side effects, but of course they shouldn't be lethal. They should be tolerable. 
they should induce protection in the population, immunity against the pathogen. It should be long lasting. You don't want to have to immunize every year. Unfortunately, with the influenza vaccine, we have to immunize every year. We'll talk about why that is. It should be cheap. WHO says in order to deliver it globally, it should be less than a dollar a dose. It should be genetically stable. And we'll talk about what that means in terms of uh, the polio vaccine in just a bit. Storage. A lot of vaccines have to be frozen. This is a real problem in places where you don't have freezers. Um, so the WHO solution has first to, they actually built kerosene fired freezers that they strap to the backs of animals and they bring vaccine into the field. And now they have these thermoses that you can put frozen vaccine in that will last for two weeks apparently frozen. But now, as you'll see later, there are ways to make viruses thermostable without freezing them that are really, really clever and are gonna replace all these issues. And finally, how you deliver the vaccine is important. Uh, most of our vaccines today are injected with a needle. And of course, that requires a needle, a clean needle. And it requires someone who knows how to use the needle. And so that means a trained healthcare person. Now, if you feed someone a vaccine, really easy. Um, and so those are preferable, but we can't do that for all vaccines. This will change also. We have new technology that is going to eliminate needles within the next five to 10 years, which will be really good. And a lot of people, of course, are afraid of needles. So that would be good for that too. So I want to tell you about a couple of different kinds of vaccines, how we make them and how they work. And we'll, we'll illustrate them with real life examples. You start with a virulent virus for which there's a medical need. And then you can make vaccines in a number of different ways, which are shown here. First, you can attenuate the virulence of the virus. You can reduce the virulence uh, genetically. We'll talk about how that works. This is called a live virus vaccine. You know, these, the word live has been used and it's hard to get away from, but of course, I don't think it's living. Nevertheless, we'll stick with the terminology. Then you can inactivate infectivity with chemicals, and this, this serves as an antigen, but of course it doesn't replicate. You can break up the particle and purify subunits that are important and inject those into people. So all of those are traditional ways. And now on the right, a n bunch of new ways which are enabled by recombinant DNA technology, the ability to clone a gene encoding a particular viral protein and express it and make proteins or particles. So you can clone a gene uh, and make particles and inject people with the particles. So this is the counterpart of the uh, non-recombinant purified subunit vaccine, except this is made from DNA. Sometimes um, you can express a capsid protein and the capsid proteins assemble into capsids. These are called virus-like particles. They don't have genomes in them, which can be good. Uh, and these are immunogenic. We'll talk about that. There are also, uh, people have worked for many years on what are called DNA vaccines. That is, you actually take a plasmid, you clone the gene of interest from the virus, and then you inject it into the muscle. And they've developed actually delivery guns that aren't needle. They just shoot the uh, DNA at high velocity into your muscle. And it turns out that this produces a nice amount of antigen that gives you cellular responses. These are being tested for HIV vaccines, but none are in use at the moment. You could also clone uh, the gene of interest into a different virus. And you can use viruses as a vector to deliver the antigen. And uh, this is being tried for HIV as well. So here are some currently licensed vaccines in the US. And not all of them are required. Some of them are for travel or for the military. So there's an adenovirus vaccine that's taken orally, uh, which is given to the military because they tend to develop uh, gastro adenoviral gastroenteritis. When they all come to boot camp, all of a sudden you have these big outbreaks of adenogastroenteritis. So they're all given this vaccine, but we don't get this. Uh, hepatitis A is another traveler's uh, vaccine if you go to certain places, as is the uh, yellow fever vaccine. This is for people traveling to areas where infection is common, so you don't need to have this if you're not leaving the U.S. There's our flu vaccine, Hep B. Everybody should get this. Um, then there's a Japanese encephalitis for travelers. Measles, mumps, and rubella are given together. That's one of the required ones. Papilloma, we'll talk about that one. Rotavirus vaccines, polio, rabies. 
There's smallpox vaccine still available. This is not used anymore. This is not given routinely in the U.S. because smallpox has been eradicated, but it is being stockpiled by the U.S. government and it's given to the military in case of bioterrorism, if someone uses the virus for bioterror attack. Then we have chickenpox and shingles vaccines and yellow fever. So we'll talk about a couple of these. Starting with an activated vaccine, you take the infectious virus, polio or influenza, and you treat it with a chemical that destroys its ability to infect cells. We say we're inactivating the infectivity. And some of these chemicals are formalin, propiolactone, uh, or detergents. So you have to make sure that this inactivation doesn't disrupt um, the antigenicity. You have to disrupt, you, you have to treat your virus and put it in animals to make sure you get neutralizing antibodies and of course eventually do clinical trials. So the first I want to tell you about is uh, the inactivated polio vaccine. Polio used to be a common disease. This is from a 1959 textbook of medicine. If you, get a, if you buy a textbook of medicine today, you're not going to find this in there anymore because we don't have any more polio uh, in the U.S. Common acute viral disease. And you can see these uh, generic symptoms of, of uh, an infection, but then in, uh, sometimes a lower neuron paralysis develops. And remember, that's the paralytic disease in one out of 100 people, poliomyelitis. This used to be quite a common disease in this country and much of the world. We used to have 20 to 30,000 cases a year. And some of those people got their lung, the muscles that uh, allow breathing paralyzed, so they were put in iron lungs. Hospitals used to be full of these, and they're all gone now. We don't have polio anymore. You can find them in museums, though. And this, of course, is polio. It's a small positive strand RNA-containing virus. Uh, FDR, the US president, had polio. He couldn't walk, actually, without assistance. And uh, he raised money. He started the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. He raised money, and that money was used to develop the two polio vaccines that we have today, including the uh, inactivated polio vaccine. So this was developed by Jonas Salk, who um, was actually born and educated here in New York. He, he went to City College and got his MD at NYU. He actually participated in making the first influenza vaccine. So he treated polio with formalin and did a big clinical trial in 1954, 1,800,000 children. And this was successful, and uh, the results were, were announced on April 12th, which is three days from now. It's, um, it's the 59th anniversary of this. Um, so this was a big deal because polio in this country was um, a scary disease. And these were the headlines here in New York City. Um, so it shows you the reaction, the emotional reaction. Salk, who's shown here, uh, became a hero overnight. Now, just coincidentally, today, I interviewed his son for my podcast, uh, Peter Salk. And it's going to be up in a couple of weeks. It's very interesting to hear his take. He said when this, this vaccine trial results came out, he couldn't answer his phone at home anymore because uh, reporters kept calling their house and he said their life was totally changed. So that's really unusual for a vaccine. So this is a rare case where one person did all of it, or one person in their lab. Uh, anyway, after this uh, vaccine was released, a, a very unusual event occurred, and that is certain lots of the virus produced by Cutter Laboratories um, caused polio in the recipients. And in the end, there were 260 cases in kids and their contacts. So problem was this virus wasn't completely inactivated with formalin. This company didn't basically follow the procedure properly. And these kids were injected with, with infectious virus in the arm. And that eventually got to their gut. And they shed it. And their parents picked it up. So this put a big, uh, a, a big nail on the vaccine. But eventually, they fixed the problem and continued immunizing. And Peter Salk talked a little bit about this, too. It was quite interesting. Um, and in the U.S., it got rid of a lot of polio from 20,000 cases a year to 2,500. Now, we'll get back to this story because we have another vaccine that takes over later. Uh, Paul Offit, who is a um, pediatric ID doc at Penn, wrote this book called The Cutter Incident, where he really goes into this IPV trial, uh, the IPV-associated paralysis that I just described. It's a really good book that uh, goes through all the details. 
So this virus is injected <laughs> intramuscularly. You get immunity, you get antibodies in the blood, and you get memory, of course. And then when you ingest virus, the virus goes into your gut, it replicates, you shed it, the virus gets in the blood, and then the antibodies that IPV induces protect you because it neutralizes virus in the blood, so it protects, it stops virus from getting into the CNS, basically. So remember that the gut is not immune uh, in people in, in inoculated with IPV. And in the U.S., it brought down uh, the cases of polio substantially um, from 20,000 to about 2,000. The other inactivated vaccine uh, we use is influenza vaccine. You remember there are three types of influenza, A, B, and C. This is an RNA virus uh, with glycoproteins in the membrane. And we immunize against types A and B largely. So we, as I said, we, have, we can have substantial deaths in the U.S. due to influenza. That's why we have a vaccine to prevent influenza-associated deaths and also serious disease. The virus, there are two kinds of virus now that we have vaccine. One, we grow the virus in embryonated chicken eggs. It happens to grow very well there. You just harvest the amniotic fluid, the allantoic fluid, and you get a, about a dose of vaccine from each egg. And it's formalin inactivated. We make a lot of doses every year, almost 100 million or more. But it's not 100% effective. Of course, no vaccine is, but it's, it's, not, it's not really good. 60% effective in kids and young adults, but over 65, it's less than 60%. So this is a vaccine that needs improvement, and many people are working on it. This is one of the reasons you need to get a, a new immunization each year, because it's not terribly effective. And when you're immunized with this vaccine, you make antibodies against the glycoproteins of the virus, the HA and the NA, and that's what protect you. Now, there is a new vaccine license just last year, uh, which is produced in cell culture. So people with egg allergies couldn't take the flu vaccine previously, but now you can because this one is grown, is grown in, in cells. Now, the, problem, the other problem, besides having a low efficacy, uh, the other problem is the virus undergoes antigenic variation. In other words, the surface proteins, the hemagglutinin mainly, change from year to year. Single amino acid changes occur in the epitopes that are recognized by the antibodies. And so because of this, in January of each year, the WHO and laboratories associated with it meet and decide the composition of that year's flu vaccine. So in the northern hemisphere, the goal is to make the vaccine available by August. So you have to start planning in January because it takes that long to, to grow it in eggs and inactivate it and so forth. So they select a set of strains every year. And this is the vaccine for this year. There is an H1N1 strain, an H3N2 strain, and two influenza B strains, okay? And again, this can change from year to year. Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it does. But you have to match the circulating viruses. Otherwise, the immunity won't be good. And some years, they don't get it. They, get, they make the wrong guess. It's a guess based on looking at what strains are circulating uh, all over the world and thinking, well, what's likely to come next season? So it is a guess, and some years they hit it, and some years they don't. So it's another problem with flu vaccines that needs improvement. Yes? Um, what is the limiting factor on the number of different strains that you can inoculate against each year? What, you mean, how many, what's the maximum number of strains that you could put into people? Well, it's a logistical problem because the, the more strains, you have to grow them all up and test them all, so it taxes the, the production capacity of the companies. Uh, for rhinoviruses, so rhinoviruses have a different strategy. They exist at a, as 150 different serotypes that are circulating, right? You can't make a vaccine with 150 different viruses, so there's, you have to find conserved ep epitopes, basically. I don't know what the number is that you can't go above, but some bacterial vaccines have 20 different specificities in them and they work. So it's probably more than that. Yeah, but you know, I don't think, I think the more you put in, then the less, with, at least with these viruses, the less chance you have of getting a good immune response. You may have to do multiple injections and that is not what they want to do. So this is a structure of the hemagglutinin glycoprotein, which is um, the blue one here in the virus. And these colored areas, are areas, these are the areas that change from year to year. These are the antigenic sites or the epitopes to which antibodies bind. And 
Uh, you can see there are a bunch of them at the top here. Uh, these are the most variable. The ones uh, down on the, on the stem, uh, these are more conserved, these CRs. These change much less because they're in the structural region of the HA. So people are trying to use these to elicit broadly neutralizing uh, antibodies that would neutralize any strain. So one day I think we'll have a universal flu vaccine which protects you against anything that could evolve. And that may involve using uh, these stem antigens rather than the head. So that's under active um, research in a number of different laboratories. Even if you could get one every 10 years, that would be good because right now every year is taxing uh, what people are able to do. The next question, which statement about inactivated viral vaccines is incorrect? So we're all over the place, huh? What's incorrect? Chemicals can be used to inactivate infectivity. Is that incorrect? No, because I just told you you can use formaldehyde or propiolactone. They do not replicate. Is that incorrect? No, they, they, they don't replicate, right? They're inactivated, their infectivity is destroyed. They can be dangerous if inactivation is not complete. Yeah, that's the Cutter incident. That is when the polio vaccine was not completely inactivated and so some kids got polio. Antigenic variation can make them ineffective. That's what happens with the flu vaccine from year to year. The virus changes, so the antibodies you have against the previous strain don't protect you anymore. So they're, none of them are incorrect. They're all right. Let's talk about subunit vaccines. Here, you take, there are two ways you can do this. You can break the virus into components and purify them, or you can clone uh, individual genes, uh, express the proteins in bacteria, yeast, or insect cells. Uh, and then purify the proteins. And usually we, we do this with a capsid protein or a membrane protein like the HA of influenza virus. So this is actually an example of a new influenza vaccine that was licensed last year. It's called FluBlock. And these are, you take the hemagglutinin gene only, the HA gene, and you express it in insect cells using a, what's called a baculovirus vector. This is a virus that infects insect cells. So you engineer the uh, HA gene into this baculovirus vector. You infect insect cells, and you do it in these big fermenters, so you make lots of it. And the medium is cheap. You don't have to use serum. Uh, and then you get pure HA. You purify it, and you can see this is an electron micrograph of the, of the HA proteins. They seem to be aggregating by their uh, distal portions, the antigenic portions are on the surface here, these particles. And then you simply, you purify these and uh, that's your vaccine. So this was tested in clinical trials and it was found uh, to be just as, actually as good as the um, inactivated vaccine, not better, unfortunately. So although this is nice because you don't have to grow virus, it's still not uh, optimal. This has been approved only for those 18 to 49 years old. Do you know why that might be? So the FDA says you can only give this to 18 to 49 year olds. Is that the age group they tested it in? It's the age group they tested it in. There's nothing special about 18 to 49 years old, near olds, I'm sorry to say. Well, there is something special, of course, but it's only because they're tested. Clinical trials are expensive, so they targeted that group. If you want to sell it to others, you have to test it in others. The problem is, if you want to make a vaccine for 65 and over, really tough because you can't have a placebo control group. Because when you have a known standard of care, you cannot take it away from people. So you have people over 65, they can die of flu. So you can't have half of the people get no vaccine and half get the vaccine. It's not fair, you can't do that. So it's very hard to do those kinds of clinical trials. Now subunit vaccines are nice because you don't have to grow virus. You just express genes in cells, so it's clean. Uh, and no genomes, no virus to worry about, inactivating, no, uh, no genetic problems. But they are typically more expensive because there are more steps involved. They're not terribly antigenic, so uh, that's possibly why the, the flu vaccine isn't as effective uh, as it could be. And these typically have to be injected, although that will change, as I will show you in a moment. So these are, these are pros and cons. Nothing is perfect. Um, there's always a trade-off. 
the hepatitis B vaccine that you should get uh, is an example of a subunit vaccine. It's the surface antigen protein. So the hepatitis virion is shown here. Remember, this has this funny double-stranded gapped RNA gene, a DNA genome in a capsid, and it's enveloped, and in the envelope is the hepatitis B surface antigen, that's the name of it. You can express the gene just for that protein uh, and get these particles that look like this, these elongated particles or the spherical particles. So the glycoproteins aggregate, and these are quite good as vaccines, uh, and these are given, this is the HB vaccine, HBV vaccine that's quite protective. Another example is the human papillomavirus vaccine. So we're all infected with uh, papillomaviruses as soon as we become sexually active because these are shed in apparently in many people. But certain types, there are over 100 types of papilloma viruses, human papillomavirus, certain types are associated with cervical and anogenital cancers. So this is a really important vaccine to make. Um, there are two on the market. Gardasil and Cervarix that have different types in them. And these are, are virus-like particle vaccines made either in yeast or in insect cells. So what they do is they take uh, the gene encoding the viral capsid protein. There are a couple of capsid proteins, but there's a major one. Uh, they express that, again, in yeast or insect cells, and the proteins assemble into virus-like particles. It just forms a capsid because all the information to assemble into the capsid is in this, the sequence of the protein. There are no genomes in these particles. That's why we call them virus-like particles. And this is given intramuscularly, and it leads to protection of the genital regions from infection. So you have to take this before you've acquired infection, uh, and then it will protect you from being infected. Although there's also evidence that even later on in life, you can um, reduce the viral burden by having this vaccine and prevent cancer. So this is an anti-cancer vaccine, essentially. It's very important uh, to have this. I think a future flu vaccine is going to be one made in plants. And uh, you can express genes in plants very readily. Uh, and people use tobacco to do this. Tobacco plants are genetically modifiable. You can easily put genes into them and express things and it's easy to purify them. You just crush the leaves and you take the fluid that comes out and you can purify your protein. So if you express HA of influenza in plants, in tobacco plants, you get particles made actually. You get an intact particle so it buds uh, out of the cells and uh, you have these HA glycoproteins on the surface. So again, no genomes here, just particles. These are very immunogenic because these are particles now. Uh, and uh, this is cheap. A square meter of plants right? 20,000 doses of uh, flu vaccine. So this is in clinical trials at the moment. I think this will be out and it'll be interesting to see how protective this is. If it's 60% or, or higher, we don't know how it's going to be. So some interesting ways of doing it. Now the reason you'd like to do that HA in plants or in some other expression system is that you can do it quickly. Okay, normally in January, say WHO tells you you need X and Y components in the vaccine. It takes you till August to make the vaccine. You grow it in eggs. Here, here's the egg-based vaccine supply. It starts to rise six months after uh, a virus is identified, for example. Let's say we have a new pandemic flu strain identified here. It would take you six months to get an egg-based vaccine supply. And in 2009, when the H1N1 pandemic virus emerged, we had a big wave of infection before we could introduce the vaccine, so we're too slow. These uh, HA expression-based vaccines could be available uh, within two or three months or four months here. So this is good because all you need is a sequence and you make the gene, you express it in cells and purify the protein. So in theory, it could possibly prevent uh, some of these pandemic waves. Now, the problem with these subunit vaccines, the HBV, the papilloma vaccines, they don't replicate, so they don't kill cells. And remember, if you don't kill cells, you don't have inflammation, and inflammation is good because it makes for a good collaboration between the innate and the adaptive responses. So you don't typically get good antibody responses to these subunit vaccines unless you put in an adjuvant. And we've learned that we add chemicals, which are called adjuvants, to vaccines to make them give a better immune response. And some of these adjuvants actually stimulate uh, inflammation. If you've ever 
immunized rabbits with antigens. If you purify a protein, you want to make rabbit antibodies, you mix it with an, with an adjuvant. Freund's complete adjuvant, for example, is mineral oil with uh, t uh, mycobacteria in it. And what the mycobacteria do is stimulate toll-like receptors and give you a good innate response so you make good antibodies. So we can't use Freund's complete adjuvant in people. We use other things that have been developed over the years. Um, some of the adjuvants we use in the U.S. are alum, which is aluminum hydroxide or phosphate. That's in the uh, HBV vaccine. Uh, in Cervarix, the papillomavirus vaccine, we use something called ASO4, which is alum and monophosphoryl lipid A. So that's diagrammed here. And if you've ever studied bacteria, you you know that this looks something like LPS. It's actually a component of lipopolysaccharide, the outer membrane component, which is a TLR4 ligand. All right, so you get, this stimulates TLR4, it gives you a good innate response, you get a good adaptive response. So it's the same thing you do in rabbits when you put killed uh, mycobacteria in them. And then there's another uh, adjuvant used in Europe for their influenza vaccines called MF59. Uh, this is squalene, which is a long uh, hydrophobic molecule shown here. It's in water, uh, and this also seems to stimulate innate responses. So these adjuvants tend to, again, give you a good antibody response. You can often use less antigen, although that's not the reason why we use them. We use them to make a better, robust antibody response. And again, they work by stimulating inflammation, so you get a good adaptive response, and they also um, allow the antigen to remain at the site of inoculation longer, and it's released slowly. So these oil and water emulsions do that, and that's better, apparently, instead of having the antigen get immediately into your circulation and dilute it everywhere. If you keep it locally, more likely to be recognized by antigen-presenting cells. So that's uh, ant adjuvants. Now I want to tell you a couple of new technologies, just briefly, which I think are all going to revolutionize vaccinology. The first one is this microneedle patch on the left. And this is basically a little piece of synthetic material plastic of some sort, which you tape onto your um, shoulder with a Band-Aid. And it's impregnated with vaccine. They're tiny needles that just go in into the subdermal areas of the skin, which have lots of dendritic cells. So they can pick up the antigen and prevent, present it very effectively. And this is painless. You keep it on for a few days and you're immunized. So these are in testing. Peter Salk told me today of a version where the needles are actually made of the vaccine. And as, as you put it in, it, they dissolve, they enter your skin, and then you just throw it away. So you don't need a healthcare worker to administer this. You can just put it on yourself. These are very cool. Uh, and then there's the question of thermostabilization. For many vaccines, you have to keep them frozen, which is a problem because if you thaw them out accidentally, you have to throw it away, it costs money, it's a problem. So uh, this is a cool way of, of thermostabilizing. So as you know, um, silkworms weave these cocoons which contain a protein called silk fibroin. You can take this protein and mix it with viruses and make a film, you can dry it into a film, and this is incredibly thermostable. So here's an example of, uh, I think, mumps vaccine where it's uh, mixed with um, this silk fibroin or not. So this is the plain mumps vaccine. And this is 45 degrees centigrade for 5, 10 weeks, 15, 20, 25 weeks. You can see the infectivity rapidly goes away. But when mixed with silk, I think the top one is mixed with silk, and silk fibroin and lyophilized, so it's dried. Look at this. It's just almost all there after 25 weeks at 45 degrees pretty high temperatures. So uh, uh, variations of these technologies are certainly going to be used. Yes? How do they reconstitute the Just add PBS and it dissolves. And then there's another technology where you can use sugars to do the same thing. Trehalose is a sugar that gives stability to proteins. And you mix the vaccine with sugars, you dry it out, and it becomes stable just like this. And then again, you just add buffer to dissolve it. And they're actually formulating these in little canisters with a lure lock tip on either end. So you attach a syringe with P 
PBS in it and a needle, and as you're injecting it, it's, it's dissolving the vaccine and going into your muscle. It's brilliant. But of course, we're going to get rid of the needle entirely and use, use this in microneedle patches. All right, let's talk about um, some infectious or live attenuated vaccines. And these are vaccines that, that replicate in you. Um, and they stimulate an immune response. And the idea, of course, is that they don't cause disease. So you have to somehow modify these viruses genetically so that they don't, that are not virulent. And remember, when we talked about virulence, we talked about identifying genes that are important for virulence. So this is why that work is important, because then you can make mutations in those genes and um, make the viruses less virulent. Unfortunately, all the... Uh, attenuated virus vaccines we have right now were derived empirically, not by genetic engineering. I'll show you what that means. I put this in the, in the wrong place, but this is as good as any. Should have been one slide before. What are some requirements for an effective vaccine? It's correct. It's all of the above. Low cost, ease of administration, provides long-lasting immunity, minimal side effects. Yep, those are all things we want. Now back to attenuated vaccines. Now with a, an inactivated vaccine, usually you have to give multiple doses. So here we're looking at the immune response versus doses. So your first dose gives you some boost of immunity. You need two and sometimes three boosters to give you an adequate response depending on the vaccine. And in polio, the IPV, you need to get three doses. Obviously that's not optimal because return visits to get injections are always problematic. So an infectious vaccine, you give one dose and it amplifies itself because the virus replicates so you don't have to have uh, multiple doses. Now, how do you make an attenuated vaccine? As I said earlier, the ideal way would be to identify a gene that's important for virulence and then mutate it so you get a virus that grows well so you get an immune response but doesn't cause disease. But we haven't done that yet. So what people have done before with yellow fever, uh, influenza, polio vaccines and others is you take the virus and you grow it in some cultured cell which is different from where the virus <laughs> normally replicates in the host. And you passage from culture to culture the viruses that grow. And what's shown in this in picture is here, this is a very simplistic view, I think. Here we're showing the virus binding to a yellow receptor uh, and then in human cells. And then if you start growing it in monkey cells, you can select for viruses that attach to a different receptor. And then these viruses don't replicate well in human cells and could uh, be a candidate for a vaccine because they're not pathogenic. It turns out that the, you do use these kinds of selections, but the differences are much more subtle than simply changing receptor recognition. Flu mist is a influenza vaccine that's attenuated. It is given intranasally, all right? They have a little syringe without a needle and they just spray a milliliter of the vaccine. You inhale and it goes into your upper tract and replicates there. And again, it's made up the same way as the uh, injected vaccine. But the difference here is that they, they developed a master strain of influenza, which was uh, temperature, cold adapted, temperature sensitive and attenuated. So they selected for all these properties empirically. Now cold adapted means the virus prefers to replicate in the upper tract, which has a lower temperature than the lungs. Temperature sensitive excludes it from the lower tract further because the lower tract is higher temperature. And then attenuated, it doesn't cause disease. And so the idea is when you're inoculated with this, the virus remains in the upper tract. You don't get disease, you get immunity. And this is mimicking a natural infection, which is good. So the problem, again, with influenza is you have to change the vaccine every year. So what they do is they, they make reassortants. They take the internal genes that confer the cold-adapted, temperature-sensitive attenuation from this master strain, and then they simply put the HA and the NA from the seasonal strain into that. They can do that reassortant by genetic engineering, make a new strain every year. Uh, if you have a choice, I would say this is the best vaccine to get. This seems to give the highest level of protection um, in, the, in the people in which it's been tested. But it's, they, it runs out every year because only one company makes this and there's not a large supply. Uh, for polio, we also have a, an attenuated vaccine I want to tell you about. Uh, this, there are three serotypes of polio virus, one, two, three, and the vaccine contains all three. 
because they all can cause polio. And these three were made by Albert Sabin and licensed in the US in 1961. And what he did was to take three virulent versions of the three serotypes, one, two, and three, and he just passaged the virus in different kinds of cells, in monkeys, in cell cultures of different sorts. He did a plaque purification, and he empirically looked for viruses that were not neurovirulent. And his assay was he would inject the virus into, right into the brain and spinal cord of monkeys and f look for ones that didn't cause paralysis. It's a pretty sensitive method. So all the strains he ended up with when injected don't cause paralysis, and then he fed them to, in clinical trials, uh, and eventually they were licensed as polio vaccines. So you, you ingest these viruses, uh, and they replicate in your gut. Many years later, after these were licensed in the 80s, we were able to sequence the genomes of these viruses and find out why they were attenuated, why their neurovirulence was reduced. And this is some work that we did in our lab and, and others. So here are the three strains of the Sabin vaccines, one, two, and three. And these are the mutations that are responsible for their reduced neurovirulence. Okay, five in the type one and two each in type two and three. So not a lot of changes. And I, I always like to say, if you went to the FDA nowadays with a vaccine, you will have to sequence the vaccine for sure. And if you showed them two changes, they would reject it outright. But back in Sabin's day, of course, we didn't have sequencing, so we only had phenotypic tests. And the monkeys didn't get paralyzed, so the vaccines were licensed. Now, you notice that they all have a change in the non-coding region. This is quite an interesting change. That's in that highly structured iris up at the 5' prime non-coding region of the polio genome. So here's polio RNA. Big open reading frame, non-coding region at the 5' prime end, and these attenuating mutations in the three strains, one, two, and three, are all in one stem loop in this number five here. And these individually really reduce neurovirulence of the virus so that it's a safe vaccine. We don't know how they work, actually. We still, to this day, do not understand why these mutations make uh, the virus unable to cause paralysis. So what happens is you ingest these viruses. They're given very easy to administer. You just drop some tissue culture fluid into the mouth of the recipient. It goes into the gut, replicates in the gut. You get gut antibodies made. Then the virus gets in the blood. You get antibodies in the blood. You get memory, and you get protection. And this vaccine was introduced in 1961. It replaced the inactivated polio vaccine because people thought that the IPV would not be able to totally eradicate disease in the US. So we switched to this one, and this in fact eradicated uh, polio in the United States. Unfortunately, it had a side effect, and that side effect was polio. At a rate of about eight to 12 cases a year, recipients of this vaccine or their parents contracted paralytic polio. And this is shown in this graph. This is a graph of polio in the US from 1961 to 2003. The line is total number of cases of polio. So Sabin's vaccine is introduced in 1961. And you can see it brought down the number of cases of polio. But these bars are the, polio, the number of polio cases caused by the vaccine. This is called vaccine-associated paralytic polio, or VAP. So you can see there was a low rate in the 60s. And eventually, the only polio in the US was caused by the vaccine. So in 2000, this is why we switched back to IPV. And now we no longer have vaccine-associated polio in the US. This, this is actually something I talked about with Peter Salk today. It's a, really, it's a really strange situation that we were willing to accept this level of paralysis to protect the population. I think in retrospect, it's probably wrong, and we should have stuck with IPV for a longer time. But the, the health services, HHS, decided that this was the way to go. Uh, and so we had a lot of kids paralyzed from the vaccine. And I was involved in a number of trials of these individuals. They sued the vaccine company because the, they say the vaccine was improperly manufactured. But in fact, it's not. I think these individuals all have SNPs in immune response genes that make them 
susceptible to paralytic disease. And this vaccine is actually uniformly good in, in most individuals. I'm going to tell you why it does this vaccine-associated polio now. So early on in the 80s, when we got the ability to sequence viral genomes, a virologist in the UK, Phil Miner, who I know well, he had his first child, and his lab technician said, when your kid gets immunized with uh, OPV, take all his diapers and bring them in, and we'll sequence the virus that the kid is excreting, right? So he dutifully took his kid's diapers for the first three months into the lab every morning. And that's David Miner, that was his son. And they sequenced uh, one base at 472, which is the base in the type 3 vaccine that's very important for attenuation. So in the vaccine, it's a U, and in the wild type virus, it's a C. So you can see after 35 hours, David is excreting a mixture of viruses with a U and C, and eventually the viruses all have a C. And these viruses are virulent. If you stick them in a monkey, which is the number here, they cause paralysis and lesions. So David was fine. He didn't get vaccine-associated polio. Everybody who gets polio vaccine, this OPV does the same thing. For all three serotypes, they revert all those mutations. Well, the one mutation in the 5' non-coding region reverts in all three vaccines, and all the other mutations eventually go as well. But most people are okay. That's why I say it's an individual genetic issue getting polio from the vaccine which doesn't make it any easier for the parents, of course, to deal with this, but I think if we would sequence their genomes, we would find that. Yes? Why does the reversion happen? I'm sorry, what? Why does the reversion happen? Oh, so the question is, why does the reversion happen? I think that um, this U puts a fitness cost on the virus, and it replicates better with a C at that position. So because the RNA polymerase is error-prone, it's making viruses with a C at pos this position, and they have a selective advantage in the gut, okay? And these, and I bet that this better replication after 48 hours is actually part of why the vaccine is so good. I don't have any proof for that, but I think that if, if it didn't replicate well, it might not be as, as good an immunogen. So this is why we have vaccine-associated polio, but I think on top of it is a genetic difference that um, we don't, we haven't discovered. <coughs> Now, let me tell you the, the rest of this polio story, which is really interesting, because we're on the verge of eradicating the second virus that we've ever, human virus that we have ever eradicated. And the polio story is really interesting. So in 1988, WHO said we're going to eradicate polio by 2000 and stop immunizing by 2005, 2010. They wanted to stop immunizing because there's this vaccine-associated polio, and you don't want to have that as the only source of disease, okay? Can you eradicate a viral disease? The only other one, that an other human viral disease that's been eradicated is smallpox. It's a terrible disease. It's a young girl with smallpox. Uh, it's disfiguring and 30% lethality. So she will be scarred uh, for life. These are all poxes caused by smallpox infection. Uh, the, the eradication program was launched in 1967. The virus was gone by 1978. You need two things to eradicate a virus. It's got to have just one host, humans, no other animal, because if it's in animals, you can't get rid of it. And immunity has to be lifelong. And for smallpox, that's certainly the case. It's also the case for polio. So smallpox meets both criteria. So does polio. So that's part of the reason why WHO targeted it for eradication. But if there's only, for example, one animal host, would it be possible to kind of vaccinate all animals that you can get in contact with? Animals? So the question is, if you had one animal host, could you immunize the animals and so eradicate? Well, it depends on you know how many of those animals are around. If they're in places that you can't reach, then it could, it's probably difficult. Yeah. <clears throat> So I think we can't eradicate rabies because it's in all sorts of wild animals and you're never going to get it, all of them. So polio vaccine is different from smallpox because it can cause polio. The smallpox vaccine never causes smallpox. It's a different vaccine. It's a different virus altogether. Same family, but it cannot revert to cause smallpox. So WHO basically said, we're going to stop immunizing because 
it, once we eradicate wild polio, that we're going to have polio caused by the vaccine. So we have to stop. So that was their plan. And they, their assumption was once you stop immunizing, the vaccine-derived polio viruses are going to go away. All right, and they're not going to be an issue. Well, that turned out to be wrong. Remember, everyone who's immunized sheds vaccine-derived polio viruses that are virulent. Everyone. Everyone is shedding revertants. So the world's sewers are full of them. And WHO said, no, these are not a problem. They're going to go away. Well, it turned out they, they were wrong. There were outbreaks of polio in a number of countries, Egypt, Dominican Republic, Philippines, Madagascar, every one of them caused by vaccine-derived polio. In these areas, the immunization levels had dropped. Vaccine-derived polio viruses came in and caused an outbreak. So this showed that they can circulate and they can cause polio. They can transmit very effectively. Another problem is when you immunize kids in their first year of life with OPV, oral vaccine, the attenuated vaccine, a fraction of these kids are immunodeficient. They don't have B cells. And these kids shed polio for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And they're fine. They don't get poliomyelitis. And a lot of these outbreaks came from these shedders, these individuals who are excreting virus for decades. We don't know where they are, and we don't know how many of them there are. So another reason why we can't stop immunizing. So you're beginning to see how this OPV is problematic. So I'm going to show you in a minute. It's almost eradicated polio, but now we are stuck. We don't, we're not quite sure what to do. So we can, these revertants can circulate for many years, and if you stop immunizing like WHO, said they would, you're going to have an outbreak because we know it happens. These outbreaks in these countries that I just told you about, it's the same situation as if you stopped immunizing on a given day. So we can't stop immunizing. So what are we going to do? Immunize forever? No, it costs a lot of money. Bill Gates is giving a lot of money to this effort and it's not going to last forever. So we have to find out, we have to figure out how to stop. Well, the WHO, after many years of debate, has decided that we have to vaccinate against the vaccine, basically. We have to change vaccines and eventually hope that these vaccine-derived viruses will go away. So after we have eradication, we switch to IPV, which doesn't, is not infectious. And this is associated with problems. It's got to be injected. It costs more. We don't know if it works everywhere because it hasn't been used in anywhere near the number of countries that OPV has been used in. So it's going to be an experiment. And then the idea is we monitor the sewage for vaccine-derived poliovirus and see if they go away. It's a big experiment. Right now, we've eradicated type 2 poliovirus. The only type 2 polio circulating in the world now is vaccine-derived type 2. So WHO is, is first telling countries to switch to type 2 IPV, and we'll see if we can get rid of these vaccine-derived type 2. Wait, why wouldn't it be effective in tropical countries? Just That's just an observation, that it's not effective in tropical countries where it's been used. We don't know why. It could be that, so that every population is different. Gut flora makes a difference as to whether the virus works or not. Now this is an injected virus. It's just been observed empirically that in certain tropical countries it doesn't work. We don't know why. You know, it, it was tried, it didn't work, so they stopped. But now we have to go back and in a lot of areas where there is polio, it's hot. So we're gonna have to see if it works. Why is it necessary to vaccinate against the vaccine after polio is eradicated? That's right. <laughs> that's, that's funny, I gotta admit, you're funny. <laughs> My wife works for a drug company, so she would say, you're a jerk, you know? <laughs> so it's neurovirulent vaccine revertants circulate. Okay. So back to the eradication. Where are we? We're, we've done pretty well. Um, so here, year to date, last year, sorry, total in 2013, 400 cases globally. Unfortunately, this is up 200 from the year before. We're at around 200, all right? And so far this year, we're above the number 
at the same time last year. So there are some problems. First of all, there are three countries where we can't get rid of uh, virus, wild virus. It's Nigeria, uh, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. Now in Nigeria, the problem is they stopped immunizing for a year uh, in 2003-ish, and we're still trying to catch up. They resumed a year later, but wild virus went everywhere. And so it's hard to catch up. And meanwhile, these viruses spread to other countries. So there have been outbreaks in uh, neighboring countries, Cameroon, Somalia, Kenya, Uganda, uh, where there had not been polio for years because vaccination rates drop and then it's imported from these endemic countries. And Afghanistan and Pakistan are particularly difficult because of the conflict there. The immunizers can't get in. They're often killed. So it's really hard to, to eradicate. And these strains we know spread elsewhere. We can sequence the viruses and know exactly where they come from. I'm sure these viruses are in the U.S. Um, now, we have an outbreak in Syria at the moment because their immunization rate has gone to 46% because of the conflict there. Uh, recently, a case just last month in Iraq, imported from Pakistan, I believe. Uh, and in uh, Egypt and Israel, they found wild viruses in the sewer. No cases of polio, but people are apparently being infected with wild virus and shedding it. Now, the country Israel is immunized with IPV, so their guts are susceptible to infection. So the virus is getting in the country, they're ingesting it, it's replicating, and passing out. So what Israel has done is to massively immunize with OPV to get rid of this, which I think is a big mistake because they're reintroducing uh, vaccine-derived strains in that country. If we looked in the sewers in the U.S., we would find wild polio because all of our guts are not immune. We all have IPV now. I got OPV as a kid, but anyone after 2000, it's a lot of people, have gotten IPV so their guts are immune. So the real question is, if we switch to IPV, can we eradicate this circulating vaccine-derived virus? Or is it going to continuously replicate in everyone's gut forever without causing disease? But then you have to keep immunization rates high because if you drop below a certain percentage, you're going to get an outbreak of polio. It's a real problem. You have to switch to IPV. You can't keep using OPV. We don't know if IPV is going to get rid of the vaccine. So we're going to Assuming we can get rid of this wild virus, which I think we can, we have to get rid of the vaccine virus after that. Yes? Are there Yes, so there are new vaccines in development, and I'm going to tell you about that in a moment. And there are two reasons. One is maybe to replace IPV, and the other, we have to be ready for an outbreak, because you can assume an outbreak is going to occur, because there's a lot of polio still everywhere. There's virus in research labs. A paper was published a couple of years ago showing that tubes of rhinovirus actually had polio virus in them. So you don't even know when you have polio. Clinical samples have it. You can easily make the genome from DNA. Uh, so you can eliminate all the sources. We need to stockpile a vaccine. And I think OPV and IPV are not the ones to do. So people are making new vaccines. Uh, one of them I think is really cool is this one. Uh, genome scale changes in codon pair bias. So what they did is to take a DNA copy of the polio genome, and they changed all of the capsid amino acids in positions which did not change the amino acid, just third position coding changes, right? So you change the sequence of the RNA. The protein is still the same. It turns out these viruses are attenuated. They seem to be immunogenic, but they can't revert very readily because there are thousands of, thousands of base changes uh, in these regions. So this is now being tested. That's one idea. There's also empty capsid vaccines uh, that are being tested as well. So it's a bit of a conundrum, as you can see. However, remember, I want to leave you with this thought. No matter what virus you eradicate, smallpox, polio, measles is next. As long as you have the genome sequence, you can make the virus again. Okay? You can easily make smallpox. Well, not so easily because it's a long genome, but it's doable. You can easily make polio. You just get the sequence and you have it synthesized by a company. You put that into cells and you get virus back. So we always have to stockpile uh, to be ready in case there is an outbreak.